Oh. Oh, thanks, thanks for having us here. Um, I was invited down by the Mayor of um, uh, Whanganui, and I was quite impressed with that, you know. And then I realised it was just Ken Mayor, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like coming around with Ken because he's, uh, he's a pretty good chairman generally. Um, anyway, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for, you know, all you, oh, you people have been here too. That's pretty cool because a lot of people that have come here today I've met all over the country and, um, and I actually like some of you. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, and it is nice to it is really nice to see you. So. <laughs> um, now we've come here to talk about relationships, actually, but um, and, and I don't want to talk about mine. I've, I just heard all about Deb. I was sitting next to Deborah down the back before, and I heard all about her relationship because she told me her um, her secret. What was it? Her innermost secrets. I think it was. What we had to talk about. And I was a bit embarrassed, but anyway. Um, so we'll, we'll get on with this. And uh, I just want to clarify one thing um, 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 Alan said there about you know, the Eel Enhancement Company. We, we don't actually represent fishermen, we represent the um, quota owners. And that's basically, that, that, these days, that's you. That's who we represent. And we're here to look after the interests of quota owners. So... Um, most of the fishermen, just, they're just employees these days, so they kind of work for you, so it's up to you to tell them what to do. Um, I, one thing, I, I, I feel a bit disappointed too. During the year, I've had, jeez, it's been so busy the last couple of years with different issues, but I've had quite a few people um, ask me to talk to them you know, about different projects, and Ben Potark is one of them. Quite frankly, we're such a small organisation, we just haven't got the capacity to engage um, with every group in the country, and there's, there's a lot of you, and there's not many of us. Because the fisheries, the commercial fishing sector is now is really small. We've got hardly any fishermen, which is all right, because we don't need many. But it's been a tremendous change over the last few years, even since the, uh, you know, the last sem uh, conference. So... Um, yeah, it's been pretty exciting. I'll just take a look at my notes here. I feel a bit sorry for Mark Griffiths. I see him getting a bit of a roasting, and that's normal. I know, might be something about Mark, because when we have these ill working group meetings, they always get pretty hot there too, so I don't think it's me. Um, to, to, now, getting back to relationships, um, you know, we've had a relationship with, with Mary for a long time, um, long before Quota came in, when it became formal, um, right back in '92, we we formed a relationship with Tainui, and that, that was pretty touchy to start with. And most of them were actually, um, but we've achieved a lot with Tainui, and uh, you know we got the we got the um, Alva transfers going on the lakes, and that's been really successful. And, and about the same time, Bill was doing his thing over there at Matahina, and there's been a lot of flow-on effect from that around the country. Most of the dams in New Zealand now have got some. <laughs> something happening in terms of um, passage and you know it all, it all started really from way back then and it's come a long way. Um, we have to, in eels we have to have relationships with everybody because it's such a diverse fishery, it's spread all over the place and it's got diverse owners. Probably the biggest owners of the eel fishery in sense of access is, is farmers so we have to have relationships with them. Um, and, and that's going to be an interesting relationship. Um, so I just, just on a personal basis, you know, I, I still, still mainly am a fisherman, but I, I find it um, pretty challenging these days because you go out in the field fishing and you're on the rivers and, you know, people, you know, you've heard a lot of people today talking about pollution and, you know, how things have been fished down and, you know, there's a lot of, bad things happening out there. Well, when you're a fisherman, it's not an abstract thing that you see on TV. It's in your face every day. And, um, you know, it really does get to me, man. It's um, pretty sad. And then you come back and you watch TV at night and you cheer up because there's some happy cows running around on a green paddock and everything's cool and everything's fenced off and the river's clean and you can drink it. So it's like living on two different planets. You know, there's Planet Real, which is where I live, and then you come back to Planet TV and cheer up. It's kind of like a drug. <laughs> anyway, uh, 
I just want to, I just want to hand over to John now because he's he's going to handle the next little piece, and we'll swap back and forth. Thanks. Kira, obviously things have changed since about 1994 when I when I had to speak like this at Pipitia Marae, and I remember a, an old gentleman called Peter Poe from Northland. He came harkering down the aisle. <laughs> that was the bullet that he pulled out and he said, this is what I've got for you commercial fellas if you come into Northland. <laughs> but before I start, I'd just like to highlight a, a, a couple of things that uh, Eco, we and Eco, Mike and I can relate to from the previous speakers. Bill. The question is, he said, it's what we are going to do over the next 20 years. The time is now. Roku, can you hear the knocking on the door? Um, Donna, the first right of the water goes to the river. Ben, look at the fish, not, not at ourselves. This is one that you might not relate to, but Sherry, Sherry, I mean, not all exotics are bad. <laughs> okay, just a, 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 quick, a quick look at the North Island commercial tuna fishery. Down from more than 15 in the 70s and 80s, some towns even had two plants for God's sake. Back in the 70s and 80s, there were more than 100 fishermen. They were all competing in an open slather to get as much catch as they could. Nobody knew who was where. Turf battles were not unusual. It was certainly not an ideal situation. And it was only when the Crown started to screw down the permit access that the numbers started to rationalise. Introduction to the quota management system finally gave the fishery some structure and structured management. This year, only 36 fishermen for the entire North Island have registered catches up to this month. And only six of these could anywhere near be called full-time. That's six full-time fishermen in the North Island. We believe that there, we in ECO believe that there are still too many part-timers and we reckon perhaps a full-time equivalent of about 15 for the entire North Island might be about right. National turnover is currently pretty stagnant and prices are low for various reasons, but mainly geopolitical, including the conflict in Ukraine and Russia believe it or not. Russia used to take a lot of our eels. This controlling stake has been achieved through the 20% of the fisheries settlement, purchases by AFL, now, now Moana, New Zealand, and various private iwi investments. Of course, as has already been said, Murray all, also hold all non-commercial customary rights. Niwa did this analysis a few years ago, it's already been talked about, but we find that commercial fishing doesn't have nearly as much of a footprint as we previously thought. Because of this, we only, we only have an idea of tuna abundance in 23% of the waterways, and we actually know very little about the rest. It should, it should be remembered that commercial fishing isn't the only source of tuna mortality. Activities like drain cleaning, flood pumps, hydro turbines, degraded habitat, restricted passage, non-commercial fishing, exotic fish competition and algal blooms can also heavily impact on, on the stocks. That's been said by just about every speaker today. Longfin is endemic to New Zealand. Shortfin is also found in Southeast Australia and some Pacific Islands, including Fiji. It does, it does mean that short fin is, is uh, less vulnerable because you've got a wider, a wider base of uh, breeding stock. 
At most, at most dam sites, there appears to be more elvers available. This is, we think, there appears to be more elvers available than upstream waters can support. This offers considerable opportunity to both customary and commercial operators if more habitat can be made available. I'll just leave that at that. ECO believes that most, most future fishery and habitat management discussions might better be held at the quota management, scale, the quota management area scale rather than the North Island or countrywide. Of course, you've got to have that Correro too, but, but uh, in the initial stages, look at as smaller areas as possible because there's so many concerns about individual rivers, stretches and waterways. Mike, your turn. Right. Um, I hate reading off, I hate reading written speeches, but anyway. Um, Pre-quota, that was in 2004, there were, there were few Maori involved in commercial eel fishing, so there were two quite separate entities. But once quota came in, things have really changed. So, so we've got that introduction of quota, and now Maori own over half of the quota and probably most of the interest in non-commercial fishing. So the challenges that now face the fishery and fishing are very much in the hands of, really, the people standing in this room today. And I think this is a very beneficial situation, as to have an eel fishery is highly dependent on having people fishing for and eating eel. Fishing for food has been around for a very long time, and, and, um, and it's an inherently honest enterprise. You can't eat reports or words. And our business relies on trust and integrity. And I trust people with skin in the game. And you guys have got skin in the game. The converse of that, of course, is I don't trust people that haven't. It's also important to have fishermen participating in the management process. And part of the reason I attend eel working group meetings is because I'm a fisherman, not a scientist. Having said that, I'm very much in favour of science, and that's how I think. And I don't like bullshit. And my job is to check that what the science says reasonably reflects what I'm seeing on the ground. Because sometimes it doesn't. And um, there's one thing I noticed at, at Eel Working Group is we don't have other fishermen here, hardly ever, particularly um, Maori fishermen. And it's it's kind of useful to be there because you need eyes on the ground, people that are actually been fishing, not people that just read computer screens. It's not good enough. MPI, and for that matter, the PCE, does not go fishing. They re rely entirely on data supplied and that data has limits. That's what Mark Griffiths sees. He, he sees data, he doesn't go fishing. So it's really important that data's good. Um, if we don't have fishing, we will not have a fishery, we will have a zoo. And if we have a zoo, you won't be eating fish. You won't be eating tuna. Because that's what happens when you have a zoo. And that's exactly what some people want. A place where tourists can take selfies with a great big long finned eel in the background. That's what we could have. Regardless of one's particular interest in the fishery, if we, if we wish to have a fishery into the future, we will all have to work together to protect and improve it. Our rivers and waterways are not managed for the benefit of fish. And it's important that we grasp that. I used to, I mean, I've always taken it for granted we'd have rivers. Well, I don't take that for granted anymore. If you've been around the South Island lately, you'll see how much irrigation there is. And eels are way down the track on terms of what's important. Irrigation is now number one and too bad for anything that lives in rivers. So first priority is looking after rivers. Now protecting our fishery will not be an easy task. We will need to be smart and we will need to have friends. We cannot leave management to self-proclaimed experts who have never lived in the outdoors. 
Otherwise, we could end up with programs like the Aerial 1080 campaign to save birds. And as we from the outdoors know, that is an absolute disaster. And it's an unfolding one, and I can't see an end to it. And it's going to end in tears. Where it has been used long term, it has killed practically all of the wildlife, and it continues, as planned, we will kill most of the native birds and wildlife throughout the country. No one will be held to account or held responsible, but the consequences will be a country soaked in poison and devoid of wildlife. And 1080 and also Bertificome certainly concern us in the commercial sector because they do end up in eels. This is largely a result of living in a technological age where gadgets, like computers, have information for people who have no knowledge. You look around today, you ask somebody a question, I asked Tony Magner a question just at lunchtime, and for the he popped up with his, you know, cell phone. And that's the thing now, is we're, we're getting a, a, we're in this age where people, people don't know anything, they just look on a machine. So whatever's in the machine, they take that as knowledge, but it's not. It's just what the machine's telling you. Okay? So I'll hand over to John again. No, that's you again. Oh, it's, oh, it's me again. No, right. We'll do that again. Have another go. All right. All right, next page. Now, how we see the fishery in 2017. Now, when we're talking about 2017, I'm talking about right now, because I've been in fishing uh, for 38 years, which is quite a long time. And, and you know, when I started fishing, I, I never thought about it changing. And, and it's changed immensely since I started. And, you know, you get to 2017, and what it's like now, another 38 years' time, it ain't going to be anything like this. And New Zealand's not going to be either. So you've got to be a bit crystal bally and try and figure what's going to happen. OK, so anyway, on to this. pre quota commercial fishing was not constrained in any useful way and was not much more than a bun fight for the last eel. That's what it was like. So let's put that behind us and move on. So once the QMS came into play, fishing and stock management became possible. Our first concern at entry was the level at which TACCs had been set. Many, us, many of us believed that while they may have been sustainable, they were too high to enable a timely rebuild of stocks, which was clearly needed. And uh, just an as aside there, once we went into the quota and, you know, uh, Maori got 20% of the quota. The first thing our Maori representative said, which was, would have been Tokum at the time, and AFL, was the people we represent, they're not worried about this commercial fishing thing, they just want eels. And, um, and right from that moment, uh, ECOs worked on building eel stocks. Because we, we absolutely understood what needed to happen, and we needed to fix the fishery, because it was in bad shape, no question. We needed to fix that, and in terms of shelving um, ace in the beginning there, me and a lot of the other fishermen, we shelved our ace too, because we just saw the urgency in fish, building fish stocks. Didn't worry about catching them, we needed to build. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we set out to do. Uh, lobbying of MPOA resulted in a decrease in the TACCs, um, <clears throat> and an increase in escape tubes, and a maximum size limit of 4Ks and protected, and protected spawning areas. <clears throat> so a consequence of these changes to regulation has been a very rapid decline in the number of fishermen, as we've said, um, mainly for economic reasons. And a big benefit of this is we now have very little conflict between fishermen, commercial or customary. These, these days, I, I practically never see another fisherman and <clears throat> well, that's that's really good in terms of the commercial sector, but because our our commercial fishermen aren't conflicting with each other. Um, but one of the things with customary confliction is there's a good and a bad there. We're not I'm not I'm not getting confliction at all. But part of the reason I'm not getting confliction is I'm not seeing them, and that's concerning. We need people out there fishing. You know, you got you customary guys, and a lot of you guys are doing it now. You're taking your young people out there and teaching them to fish. You need to, because believe me, the amount of you know, non-commercial fishermen out there has dropped dramatically. I used to see it a lot when I started fishing, but not now. It's a big deal. And you older guys that are fishing, get into it, eh? Good on you. Um, 
Uh, and also, because there's so few fishermen, we've got a lot more control of the fishermen. There's not many of them, and, and you can get involved in that. A further consequence, <coughs> further consequence, consequence of the decline in fishing fishermen has been a very rapid decline in area of fishery that is fished. I mean, the Nero survey says something like 23%. But I doubt that it's anything like that. I, I would think we're probably at about 15% of the fishery that we're actually fishing now. It's really shrunk. My, most of our commercial fishing's on big water, most of it, you know, on big rivers or big lakes. But that's not necessarily the most productive water. As a result of these changes, we now have achieved some very good improvements in stock structure and CPE, which are vital for healthy fishery. And in the unfished waters, where we have no data, I assume that the stocks have increased considerably. Recruitment has been stable over time and more recently shown improvement, as we would expect. Overall, we're very pleased with the way which stocks have rebuilt. They really have improved out of sight from where we were when we went into quota, and all the fishermen are saying this. Some locations are now as good as they can be, but for others there's still room for improvements, and we have some plans in mind to achieve that. There's a lot we can do yet. It is very encouraging to see that an increasing number of landowners are starting to take responsibility for the wider environment and managing waterways on their properties in a constructive manner. It's only a small start so far, but it is a start and it can only grow as public and market pressures bear down on the rural sector. Regional councils remain incredibly stubborn and resistant to change. They drive me nuts. We're getting the farmers to change, and they're pretty hard, but the regional councils, they are, they're just the same old dinosaurs they've always been. How hard can it be to change them? Oh, sorry, it was one or two years. <laughs> Tough. Uh, but again, the general clamour from the public will surely get better water quality, can only be ignored for so long. Uh, I also note the increase in iwi activities in improving the eel fishery, particularly the involvement of young people. And there's a lot of it going on, there really is. I'm, I'm, it comes to my attention because of my position. But anyway, but improving stock structures is the easy part, and that's really the only part eco, and you know, that's, all, but that's all we can do. Freshwater and waterway management priorities are now our greatest challenge. If we don't have rivers, we won't have a fishery. In a country that gives away its best spring water to foreigners free of charge and prioritises irrigation over flowing rivers, it's going to be a very tough challenge initiating a change of course, but it's a change we must achieve. That's my view. Thanks. Fishery management is all about making decisions. Somebody has to make decisions. Let me give you an example. If the Ministry of Primary Industry decides to manage the tuna fishery to maximum sustainable yield, which is the default, then yes, it'll be sustainable, I accept that, but the ramification will be smaller tuna and more areas of localised depletion. To put it out there, ECO does not believe that we should be managing that way. ECO wants a well-stocked fishery with a lot of big eels. So who makes these decisions? Well, it's the Ministry of Primary Industry. What needs to be transparent is who is in the minister's ear, or ministry's ear, and perhaps more importantly, who's in the other ear. Habitat is no different. Let's look at an example of habitat decisions, decision making. A regional council might decide to pull out all the good, mature, riparian trees with big root systems and cover, and replace them with flaxes and grasses. Attractive? Yep. But just watch the tuna biomass in that stretch of water plummet. Decisions like these are really important for tuna, and there are multitudes of them every year. The poor old decision maker is getting advice from everywhere. The ministry is getting conflicting signals, 
and we end up getting poor decisions or no decisions for the stakeholders. For various reasons, we hear of frustration at the stock assessment process. Just in here. Now, that is the area not where management decisions are made. It's just stock assessment. Now, Mike and I and the, and the working group, we sense the frustration that Mataronga Māori has not found, yet found a decent space alongside the Western science. We know that conversation is long overdue. After many years of working in the working group, and for Mike and I it was the mid-90s, and it's a pretty dry subject, Mike and I have learnt that it's difficult to assess fish stocks. It's really difficult. And eels are amongst the hardest of all the fish stocks to do. We can, we can both vouch for the hard work and the integrity of the MPI and Niwa people who grapple with this on a daily basis. It ain't easy. I suspect, uh, given what, what Alan just said before, I suspect iwi also find it difficult to generate balanced advice when everybody wears both a customary and a commercial hat, by definition. It can't be easy. So in summary, if, uh, for this slide, if we want good decisions, we might do well to find common ground before we take it to the decision maker. Here's just one possible way we might help the ministry make better tuna fishery dis fishing decisions. Of course, the devil is in the detail, and what a tuna collective might look like is yet to be decided, or even if there should be one. But I'm just throwing it out there. Whatever the structure, we need to find agreed strategies, collectively get into the ministry's ear. <laughs> Some possibilities are annual fishing plans combining both customary and commercial aspirations. Fine scale reporting, I mean GPS reporting. Mataronga Māori incorporated into the science and management processes. And when I hear, I mean I've known Ian for a long time, but, but that Māori compass incorporates already so much more into what is important for tuna than just catch rates or CPUE. I see it as really, really good stuff. Where we can collaborate with third parties, such as DOC and NGOs and the bigger companies, we should. Right, <laughs> current habitat decision making. Um, <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> well, there's been a lot of concern about longfin and um, and habitat decisions are made around longfin all the time and mainly the decision is to um, that you get from regional councils is a rip out willows because that's what they really like doing and I've got to say and <clears throat> from an eel fisherman's point of view with 38 years of experience the crack willows we have in the rivers are the most important single plant species we have for longfin end of story we just haven't got anything else that replicates them. So we see these rivers like we see everywhere where there's all the rollers are ripped out. Well, they're not going to have longfin. I'll tell you that now. And recruitment's not going to help. We've got plenty of recruitment. What we're short of is um, cover. So, industry, especially farming, has big clout, okay? And, and they tend to dictate how our rivers are managed. Not us. We have very little say at all. Eels have a very small commercial fishing funding base. We've got commercial, and we're, it's pretty small, but, um, but customary, where's that at? Or non-commercial fishing. Unlike other fisheries, there's no recreational fishing industry. How many people buy a $50,000 boat to go and catch eels? Or spend 10 grand on fishing rods to go and catch eels you know it's which in, in terms of non-commercial man it's just a tiny thing so we haven't got that big non-commercial industry supporting um, recreational fishing got no license revenue like fish and game has 
you can go fishing. It's free. And, you know, you'd never be able to sell licences anyway because who's going to buy them? So not a lot of gin palaces in the uh, recreational sector in Eels. Regional councils are managing our waterways and they manage pretty well for everything except fish. Fish is way down the list in what they manage for, if they even think about it. And this desperately needs to change. And this is really a legislative matter. It's way beyond the scope of what ECO can achieve because we're tiny. And even combined, we're not very big. Eels, fish and rivers themselves must be given heavier weighting in the decision process, in the legislative process. A, multi a multitude of factions with different gripes and ideas of the years, uh, of the years, uh, in the years of local bodies. So conflicting advice simply serves to preserve the status quo and our rivers will remain as stormwater drains to the coast in an unlimited faucet for irrigation. The only way we will get regional councils to properly include fish in their management objectives is by collaborating with powerful partners and giving consistent, pragmatic and well-considered advice. Okay, so we need some big changes at a high level. Yeah. Um, so in terms of customary and commercial sectors, just how far apart are we? Well, I don't think we're really far apart at all in what we want because in terms of commercial fishing, we, we need to have a fishery that's full of good-sized eels. That's what it's got to be like. Um, that's, for, for a commercial sector to survive, that's what it's, it has to be like that. And you can read through those as well. But I don't think, I mean, it's apart from a, um, you know, a, a belief issue in terms of the, what things might look like, we're not, I don't think we're far apart. Um, but in any, any event, in my personal view is that, you know, you look after the customer side of things first anyway, and uh, we always have, and I hope that continues. So we came to the conclusion that don't we all want more abundant eels? Don't we all want bigger tuna? Do any of us want toxic algal blooms? Do we want to manage towards maximum sustainable yield or perhaps pull, it, pull the, pull the uh, foot off the accelerator and uh, a, a more conservative approach? Do we want less stressed and better waterways? Does anybody not want the best available riparian plantings and management? And it's, and it's, not, and it's not one plan suits all, we know that. Do we want to improve fish passage both up and down the rivers? Do we want to work together to minimise turbine and pump damage to tuna? Thank you, Ken, to A, for the privilege of being able to speak here.